All right, <laughs> here we go. Um, welcome everyone to another Birdies Conversation. Um, the topic of this conversation is embracing your culture. Uh, Angel City has partnered with Birdies on this talk series to discuss important topics for how we can all level up personally and professionally. Um, what does this mean when we talk about culture? Um, LA is an incredibly diverse city. It's part of what makes our city so beautiful. Um, and having a strong cultural identity personally and as a community, it can be difficult at times, difficult to navigate, especially when there are differences, but it's also something that we at Angel City really want to celebrate. So in our conversation today, uh, we're going to speak with Angel City Defender, Madison Hammond, and uh, a member of our community team, Coco So. She leads up all of our street team efforts, all of our grassroots outreach. So welcome, everyone. I am Catherine Davila. I am the head of community at Angel City. Um, and before we uh, do anything else, I want to officially introduce these two incredible people. So first, obviously, Madison Hammond, Angel City defender, all around badass. I have a question for you. We're just coming to the end of our season, first season of Angel City. You were part of this inaugural team. What are you going to remember most about this year? I think that in preparation for this question, I just there's so many different things that kind of made Angel City special, especially as the first year. But the thing that I keep coming back to is just the fan engagement at our games. And I think that every week we just packed out Bank of California and – when I tell people we pull on average 19 to 20,000 fans, they're just blown away. And I think that that is what is going to make bringing soccer back to LA so special is not just because it was an obvious decision. It was finally time, but we have a fan, we have a fandom and just like so much loyalty and so much love that really just spreads throughout the club. And that really propels us through the season that took us through really tough times and really good times this year. And so I'm really excited for next year, but I think that was a major highlight for this year. That's amazing, Madison. And I got to say, you're, you're talking to two people who as part of the community team, I know that means a ton. <laughs> so Coco, you know, as community coordinator um, and heading up the street team, First of all, what is it like to hear one of the Angel City players basically singing the praises of all the work that you do on a daily basis? I mean, amazing. I I think everything Madison voiced is uh, stuff that I've noticed, but like I haven't had to take it. I haven't taken a second to slow down and really like process it and let it sink in. Um, we put so much work into the community work, work we do. We, you know, dive into every nook and cranny and corner of Los Angeles to make sure that everybody knows who Angel City is. And it shows on game days, like Madison said, an average 19 to 20,000 people. It's absolutely wild. And I think it's something that's meant to be experienced. So if anyone's listening to this and you haven't been to a game yet, whole new season coming up. I know. I feel like seats are so in demand already. I'm already like struggling to get my family tickets for next year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be Angel City if we didn't say you got to get to a game. Um, and you do, if For you haven't sure. been. Um, but I do love, I love hearing sort of that this perspective on the community that has been built around Angel City and, you know, hopefully representative of our culture or the many cultures across LA, that that, that has resonated with you, Madison. Um, going from like this big community picture and the 20,000 fans down to a more personal level, um, how do you identify culturally and, and why is that? Um, so for me, I, you know, this was my third year technically as a pro. And when, in 2020, I went from just a rookie trying to get a contract to all of a sudden becoming the first Native American to play in the NWSL. And it was something kind of like a tagline that has followed me through my career now. And in the beginning, I was very nervous about what response what responsibility that hold, that held. And I think that as I've kind of adapted more to the league, adapted more to being a pro, I can proudly separate the two and realize that a lot of people are not just interested in my story as an athlete and what I do on the field, which can take up a lot of like the mental toll of just like 
wanting to play and wanting to be on the field and, you know, the grind of being an athlete. But for me, I'm like, people want to know like who I am. And so for me, I identify as a biracial woman. I'm from the San Felipe Pueblo in New Mexico in the Navajo Nation. And I'm also half black. And so everything that I do in my career as an athlete is done with so much intention to carry forward who I am as a person and my cultural values from my family. And it's just so much more about, it's so much about so much more than what you do on the field. And I think I have a really um, fortunate opportunity to be at a club like Angel City that wants to embrace that culture, wants to highlight it, wants to put it um, on display in a way that not a lot of other places and a lot, not a lot of other sports do. I think that the NWSL tries to tell stories in a very intimate and authentic way. And so I've really reaped the benefits of that. That's amazing, Madison. Thank you. And props also to our content and storytelling team. (laughs) It's just a love fest. I love it. Um, You, you brought up something that I think is interesting and maybe at the crux of of this conversation about culture, um, which is that you identify as a biracial woman. What, what do you think Madison is the difference between race, ethnicity, and culture? Um, and why is that distinction important? Oh, the hard hitting question. I know. I mean, I think that if we got down to a literal sense, I feel like the your cult, someone's culture is more action based and what you, what are the things that you do and what are the things that are important to you to make up who you are as a person? Someone's race and ethnicity is not something that they can change about themselves. They're born that way. And I just feel like your culture is something that is very personal and individualized to everyone and how much they choose to tap into their culture is totally up to them and is their prerogative. And I think that culture and people's cultures are what kind of defines like social trends and society and like how we move amongst each other that is where more of like the interpersonal dynamics between people happen so it's like how does your culture influence your friendships and your relationships and how you interact with your community i feel like it's a much more action-based idea and concept yeah that's that's really interesting um and just to to speak a little bit to you know who i am and what my culture is because i to the outside world and to myself. I mean, I am a white woman, um, but I feel very deeply Latina. And so that connection to my Latinidad, to my family, to all of that means when it comes to language and experience um, and interaction, I think you've you've really hit on something important. Um, And so, you know, Coco, for you as somebody who, you know, your family's Chinese, you're Chinese American, um, or really, why don't, Tell us how you identify um, and sort of what your experience is of bringing your culture to the work that you do. Yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head. I am Chinese American. Um, My family is from Hong Kong and Southern China. So I grew up speaking Cantonese around the house. And I think how I kind of bring my culture into the work I do is that I show up every day exactly as I am. Um, I think that's something that gets overlooked a lot, but I like, it's like Madison said, like race and ethnicity, that's not something you can change about you. When people look at me, they see a Chinese woman and that's, that's, that's always going to be who I am. So when I show up in a space, I make sure, um, if I'm, you know, asked about it in a respectful manner, I will tell people my story. I will let them in and let them know that, yes, I am Chinese American. Yes, I do speak the language. If that's helpful to you in any way, we can, you know, code switch and chat in Cantonese. If not, I'm happy speaking in English and I'm happy to chat, you know, more about it if you have any further questions. Um, I think something I'm also working on with our community team is I want to do a lot more work in, you know, my community. I grew up in Chinatown, Los Angeles, and later on moved to Alhambra, which is 15 to 20 minutes outside of downtown LA. Um, But it's also a heavily Chinese uh, East Asian enclave. So I would love to, you know, increase the amount of work we do in those communities because um, we haven't done all that much in the past. And it's it's a work in progress. Catherine knows um, as, you know, the head of our community team. Um, she knows how passionate I feel about this. I hope 
that, you know, the next generation of young Chinese girls out there can look up, you know, any professional team's front office. I hope, you know, a young Angelina can look up, you know, Angel City's front office and see, uh, see my last name, see my name, look me up, do whatever they can and know that they have a space here. Somebody here is rooting for them and that, you know, I, my goal is to, you know, leave this space better than I found it. So they have a path forward. I feel like you hit something so interesting about just the importance of sport and like how much confidence that can give somebody. And Mm -hmm. for me, it's kind of driven me forward in every space that I enter. And so it's almost abnormal when I, I feel more comfortable than not in a lot of spaces. And a lot of it is because of sports and it might've been intimidating to not see people that look like you in you know, on all of your sports teams. And, you know, I played soccer, which is a predominantly white sport, super expensive. I played, I played soccer, which is a predominantly white sport in Northern Virginia, which is like a <laughs> trifecta for just like a lot of whiteness. And I think that that could have been really intimidating. And it definitely was, especially through college and things like that. But the confidence that sport gave me, I could always rely on that. Yeah, I think That's... sports is one of those spaces, yeah, where I, I think who you are, what you look like matters less. It's more about how you play, and it's a big equalizing factor in all of that. It's 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 definitely helped me with, you know, my confidence, my feeling comfortable with myself and giving me a sense of purpose. I talk to Catherine about this all the time, but, like, I truly believe in the power of sports to move the world, and it's it's what gets me out of bed. It's what gets me doing this work. Um, you know, here at working in community, we basically have no weekends because we work five days a week and then we have community events on the weekends. But I, I keep going knowing that, you know, like, this is going to change somebody's life. Can we get somebody to co- get the community day, community team a day off? Like, that's just, it's just so much. And I, I think that, like, I, from a player perspective, it's amazing because there are so many teams, especially in this league, where that falls onto the players. And I do think that we as players have more work to do, especially like in the community and being more engaged, but to have like a full-time staff that's just devoted to how is our, how is to what you just said, how is sport going to move the needle? I just like, it's awesome. It's so appreciative. I'm just, it's actually me here to just like compliment you guys. So (laughs) we can just keep this going. I am so glad that we're recording this as we plan for 2023 and resourcing. This is excellent. I'm going to just play this for the board and for Julie. Um, no, I think, I think this, this sort of confluence of culture and sport, um, I think it's, it's really important and it's at the heart of, of what we're doing for sure. Um, both of you have talked about representation and what that meant to you or, or maybe not seeing yourselves represented and, and how that felt. What has this journey been like for you? And we'll start with you, Madison, to understand and embrace your culture. Has, has it ever been difficult to do so? Um, it's definitely been difficult, but I think that overlapped with time periods in my life when I was a lot younger. Um, I get told all the time that I'm still a young player. And so it actually all occurred before I was even a pro. Um, I, in college, so in high school, I went to a just extremely diverse school where every type of person went to my high school. And so I was friends with Asian people and Middle Eastern people and people from Africa and people from countries in Africa, like Ethiopia and Eritrea and Ghana and So I was just exposed to so many different, as we've been talking about, cultures and foods and languages. And so that seemed very normal to me. And when I went to college, it was a very different experience. I went to a really small school um, in North Carolina, Wake Forest. And it was the first time in my life where I was just surrounded by predominantly white people all of the time because you're at school. And Mm -hmm. it was different than home because even if I was surrounded by communities where you didn't see a lot of people of color, I would go home and I am, was raised in a family that where we have our own culture and practices and things like that. And so it was a definite culture shock for me. And I like really struggled with kind of figuring out who I was in that type of space because 
I was different and exotic and unique looking and to all of these people, which is great when it's posed as a compliment, but then you think about it and you're like, I don't think that was actually that cool. <laughs> and it was, it was really hard to deal with like imposter syndrome and feeling like on a personal level, oh, my friendships feel just different and there's nobody that really looks like me. And it just all kind of culminated at one point in my junior year um, when our school went through some institutional reckonings um, with kind of some of our, the school's history and some of the principles that the school had been founded on and things like that. And I realized that a lot of the racial diversity on campus was only in the athletic community, yet we didn't have a seat at the table in terms of conversations regarding school, um, conversations regarding student athlete council, any conversations that had to bridge the gap between athletics and the larger school population, we just weren't included. And the president of our school had never even been into the student athlete buildings where millions of dollars were being donated every year. And it was kind of a wake up call for me to realize that other people weren't willing to speak up. And I actually ended, uh, ended up penning a letter to our president and I was kind of laid out all of these stipulations of like, you know, you ask, we had had this, these things on campus called call to conversations and they were supposed to be where people could come together and have these kind of discussions. And I went to one and I was like, this is the most whack thing I've ever been to in my life. It was like, <laughs> def like describe a moment that was challenging. And people were talking about like, like it was hard to apply to Wake Forest. And I was just like, this is, this is so not productive. And so that's what sparked my annoyance honestly to respond mm -hmm. and what ended up coming out of that was that the president ended up coming to our student athlete advisory committee committee meeting actually came to one of our student athlete buildings and we just sat and had a conversation and we were like look we are not included enough and because of that work i felt like i was able to kind of reclaim more of my identity as a woman of color on mm -hmm campus and just in my in my life and I finally in my experience was like I'm not gonna for the first time in my life I was like I'm not gonna compromise who I am and change who I am to just fit into a space and so that was really good for me because once I became a pro you're already questioning so much as an athlete like who I am who do I want to be what kind of player do I want to be what does my career look like and so to have a sure sense of who you are as a person is just really important and this has turned into a bit of a tangent, but I just think that that experience, particularly in college, like really helped me be able to stand up for Black Lives Matter, Native, um, bringing indigenous awareness to my teams and being a part of the conversations in 2020. I was already prepared and I already knew like mm -hmm. how I was going to present myself. And so that was really helpful for me to keep gaining confidence, build relationships that have really been foundational to me as a professional athlete, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't gone through that when I was 19, 20 years old. Yeah, like that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of responsibility um, and kind of a lot of the onus being on you um, or on anyone to like, in addition to just like living your life, trying to achieve your goals, also be thinking about how you ensure that your identity is appreciated, seen a part of the discussion. Um, you know, there there is undoubtedly still racism and xenophobia alive and well in our country and in our sport. Um, but there has been, I think, a shift toward like encouragement to, to wave your flag, right? Whatever that flag might be. Um, there are things that are like, you know, heritage months where it's a celebration of culture and identity. Um, but I think there's an interesting conversation going on right now around when when do we get to move past that? Do we get to move past that ever? Um, and so, Coco, when we're talking about these heritage months and there's AANHPI month, for example, um, how much do you want to be celebrated in that kind of pointed way where it's we because because we're not doing this year round, we need to dedicate a full month to it? What's your thought on that? Um, 
I like to joke and say that um, May and June are my nightmare months and that May I have to reckon with my Chinese American identity and June I have to reckon with my other identity. But um, May, I think, has been I've been thinking a lot about this since this past May and the May before that. But I think with AANHPI month, um, so the NH part, the Native Hawaiian part, actually, um, is a prime example Growing up, I only ever heard of AAPI month, and I can't even say growing up. That I probably started hearing about it around college. Before that, I feel like it was still not highlighted. Um, but including the NH, I think, is an example of how I think language and language around cultural topics like this are constantly evolving um, as we, you know, grow as a country, as a people, as humans. Um, we recognize that there are people we've overlooked in the past that deserve to be included in this as well. And so we take steps to highlight them. Um, so with AAPI month, like you said, Catherine, I, as long as I feel, I feel fine about it, I guess, not amazing, not the, but, um, just fine because I think so long as I know that the company angel city, for example, I know that, um, I know that I'm welcome to speak up and talk about AA and HPI topics, want to bring Angel City to AA and HPI communities. Um, I know that I'm free to do that year round. So when May comes around and if I get, you know, asked to speak more on my cultural identity or to, you know, lead the LA and five, um, the AA and HPI edition, I'm happy to do so because I know that behind the scenes, I'm welcome to, we, we aren't just doing that because it's May. I know that I can make change happen year round. Um, and granted, like, this is me holding myself accountable. I, I think I need to do more in that front to speak up around the clock, but I, I, I feel fine about the month. Thank you, Coco. Um, for you, Madison, you know, where, at least right now, because Co as Coco said, these things evolve, right? But where, where right now is the line for you between, say, celebrating and honoring culture and tokenizing it? For me... I think that there is a way to celebrate people and participate in the honoring and celebration of people's cultures without making it your own fight. And I think that mm -hmm. the line is when people start taking on problems and initiatives as their own, when they have not had to experience the things that negatively impact communities of color. And there's a way to be an advocate and an ally by promoting the words and actions of others instead of making anything about you. And I think that there's, you know, so many communities, whether it be LGBTQIA plus or native communities, Asian American communities, black communities in particular, and making, it's honestly like making problems when they don't exist or it's something that you find offensive because you think that it should be something that is offensive, but it might not actually be offensive to the community that is in jeopardy. And I think it's mm -hmm. difficult because you want people to join the fight. You want people to live in a way where you're just anti-racist and live in a way where you're just accepting of other people's cultures. But I appreciate when people are adamant and passionate about what they believe in and what we, what people should stand up and stand up for, but it's better to let those who are directly affected have the stage and have the moment and just be a part of uplifting their words and their struggles and their triumphs. I think a lot of allyship is rooted in trauma and negative experiences when there are so many things that are that positively happen in these communities. And it doesn't always need to be so dark and negative. Like the world is already so scary and so ugly sometimes. And there's so many beautiful things that we can celebrate. And I think that the best kind of allyship works to do that instead of only, only highlighting struggle. Like struggle is not mm -hmm. what defines my identity. Struggle is not what defines minority communities or communities of color. It is words like resilience and adaptation and, badassery and like beauty like those are the things that divide that define these communities and it doesn't always have to be like the struggle and I think so many people think like oh if you come from these communities you just must have had it rough and there's such a plethora of experiences that come out of these communities and 
I think that we as people of color are not a monolith. There are so many different experiences and stories to be told. And that's what makes it so amazing. But I think that people just try to be like, oh, it must have been rough. And I'm like, it wasn't that rough, but it's been a little tough. I don't know. Uh, that is such a, that's such a powerful idea. Um, and I've seen, I mean, I've seen statistics about everything from, you know, the, the stories that get told to things like, what are the the movies that are, you know, predominantly black casts that get nominated for Oscars? And what are those movies always about? Um, and yes, it's like, yeah. And it's like, I mean, true, Moonlight, a, Moonlight is like actually one of the best movies ever, but it's so sad. And I've watched it twice <laughs> and I probably will never watch it again because it's so sad. And it's like when people are like, oh, 12 Years a Slave is a great movie. I'm like, I will never watch that movie. I don't mean to watch that movie. That doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> is it sort of like a, a re-experiencing, even if you haven't obviously experienced that level of trauma? I think it's more so like those movies are not made for the communities they're representing. They're made for people who don't know that it happened. And so it's not like, I don't need to see, or some, what, what was another movie that was like got a lot of praise? Harriet. Like, I don't need to watch the story of Harriet. Like I know what Harriet did for my people and for probably my ancestors, but it's just, I don't need to watch the movie about Harriet. And I think that mm -hmm. there's so much, um, I don't even want to, it's not, like, people just love watching movies about trauma. And I'm like, why? Like, I, we don't need to. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's a catharsis involved. Um, but it is, it's, it's a difficult subject. Um, and so if you, and Coco, I'll go to you first on this, but I would love to hear from both of you. If you think about how you would like to see your culture and your identity represented, what comes to mind? I mean, I think the most obvious answer is I want to see people that look like me around me. Um, I want to see so I want to see those voices highlighted. I want to see those voices amplified. I want I, I want to hear you know all the stories and see all the praise and give all the flowers um, and just you know being in a space where I can look around and feel like I belong because I see familiar faces that look like mine. I think that's I think that's a a, a good first step. And I think a second step in, you know, thinking about what Madison was just saying about representation in film or like the types of films that are made about you and your culture, like the first one that comes to mind is Crazy Rich Asians, damn it. And Okay, I was like, going to ask about Crazy Rich Asians because one, <laughs> I love that movie. I cry every time, but I I feel like I am so... Inex no, I'm not even inexperienced, but, like, I don't have a full understanding of, like, what does Crazy Rich Asians actually mean for the Asian community? Uh, it represents the 1% in that I will never, ever be able to acquire or achieve that level of wealth in my life. I have come to terms with that. I am perfectly fine with that. Um, and... I think what people take out of that movie is, oh my God, like it, it kind of reinforces the model minority myth that, you know, mm. all Asian folks, um, you know, are, you know, ha have some level of wealth to them and that, oh, they, you know, don't understand oppression or they can't experience racism because they are the model minority and they to align themselves with, you know, communities in power so that they get this you know, scoot by while other communities are going through their own reckonings and their own versions of xenophobia. Um, and that's what I take out of it. I enjoy the movie as well. I also sob every time. I love that they included a Chinese version of Yellow by Coldplay because that song and the meaning behind it too makes me sob every time. Um, I think the singer is a, I'm going to get this wrong. I think she's Taiwanese American, but I'm not sure. Um, but she or they requested that Coldplay make this movie, or actually the director did, um, requested that Coldplay allow them to use this song because he um, told a story about how when he hears yellow, it's the color of his skin and it's a celebration of the color mm -hmm. and it's something that he hadn't ever considered before and that's the meaning behind why they want that song and that movie sung in Chinese. And 
I think it's beautiful. So there's, I'm not going to blast the movie and say like it was the worst thing that ever happened to Asians ever. <laughs> but um, I, I enjoy the movie as well. I love it. But I think it gives off uh, an impression of Chinese Americans or um, I think they're in Singapore for that. Like it gives off an impression about my community, about AA and HPI folks um, that I think is just inherently false or representative of very, very, very few, few people. So I think uh, when I think about representation, I want people to move away from what they see in, just in the media. I want people to, you know, go out there and actually immerse themselves in diverse communities in a respectful manner. Of course, we were already talking about the line between appreciation and appropriation, but um, to really just go out there and experience the world and experience diversity for yourself. Don't, you know, take everything you see on social media or, you know, the actual media to be, to mean, to be fact. Because at the end of the day, this is all to make money. It's all drama dramatized and exaggerated and curated, um, you know, for people to view. Um, so, yeah, I think a big part of it is just going out there and experiencing the world for yourself with an open mind and an open heart and understanding that, you know, the way you show up in a space with whatever your cultural identity, whatever identities you hold within yourself, um, that's how people are going to perceive you and to be cognizant of that and of others as well. Thank you, Coco. And that, I mean, that really is how we as a team as Angel City have gone out in the community and approached the work that we do in building that community. Um, Madison, if we think about our league, our industry as a whole, you know, from youth through the pros, when it comes to creating, you know, sort of more, more acceptance of a broader a range of, of cultural identities and experiences, what do you hope for, for our industry? My hope is to just see black and brown kids and kids of color just becoming the face of the sport. I think for so long that we have carried carried the water and, you know, just done a lot of work to be advocates in the community and also advocates of our sport and continue showing in, showing up day in and day out that we're top level performers in this league. And I think that oftentimes in terms of marketing dollars and where are you putting your money there are so many more opportunities to put it into black and brown athletes. And I want to see companies and I want to see sponsors continuing to do that and continuing to prop up these people who have done so much work. I mean, you look at somebody like a Crystal Dunn and Crystal Dunn has been around forever. And it seems like in the past five years is when she's only getting her flowers. And even that, it doesn't even compare to other athletes. And I think that that's okay. And I just think that it's all in the name of promoting women's soccer and uplifting our sport and uplifting us as athletes, which is first and foremost, but there is a way to do it to give credit where credit is due. And so I think that is my hope as we move forward is to just keep giving recognition and telling the stories and spending the money where it's needed. And like snaps for Crystal Dunn. And can we just take a moment and acknowledge that incredible goal that she had in the semifinals for the, the playoffs like holy cow that was a goal like and coming back after five months what an what an incredible moment and then the celebration afterwards was like pure joy um it was beautiful that was unreal truly unreal i was i'm yeah. like she was absolutely i i, could, I had no words it was just no words <laughs> I, I watched it a few times, just like kept going back <laughs> and watching that strike. And then the celebration afterwards is so like beautiful so and fully cute. joyous. It was just like, right? I mean, it's been five months since she had a child. I didn't have a child five months ago. And to just be like, all right, I'm gonna put the game on my back. <laughs> we have, and Birdies has, uh, the Game Changer. It's the limited edition of their shoe, the Swift. It rocks the official Angel City colors and emblem. We hope the shoe um, and everything that it means will inspire, support, and empower you to be a game changer. You can get it on birdies.com, angelcity.com, and at the Birdie store on Abbott Kinney in Los Angeles. So thank you both, Madison and Coco. Hugely appreciate you taking the time um, for being vulnerable, for sharing yourselves and your thoughts and your hearts. Um, before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or is there, there any one thing you've said today that, that you really want to drive home? Madison, go for it. Okay. Um, 
There's nothing, I mean, I think that we've covered so many different areas. So I guess all I can say is November is Native American Heritage Month. And I would encourage you all to give back to small owned Native businesses. Um, it's one way to support your local community. But one other thing that I would challenge people to do is to do a little bit of research and learn about the land that they currently reside on. Um, doing land acknowledgements is one way to recognize the history and brutal history that Native communities have gone through. And the Los, An the Los Angeles area has been home to a plethora of tribes, particularly the Tongva people. And so I encourage people to acknowledge the land that they reside and work on and just be respectful and give back to it in any way that they can. Thank you. Coco, any final thoughts? Um, like Madison said, I think our conversation today was very nuanced and we touched on a lot of topics and it certainly isn't the end of all this discussion. Um, I think um, a large part of, I think, being an ally is also just doing research and some reading on your own and not just, you know, expecting people of color or folks of that community to do the work for you. So, yeah, um, much like Madison said, I challenge everyone who's listening right now to go out there and put in that work um, and just know that all the people of color, all your friends, family, anyone, those folks in your life will surely appreciate you for that. So, mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. There is, we touched on a lot. There's so much more uh, that we can talk about. Uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with both of you and with our broader community. Thank you so much. Bye.